So, we've been, for the last two classes, exploring the uh, topic of preaching. And we spoke about, you know, the need for preaching, what is preaching, and different kinds of preaching. So tonight we'll focus a little bit about Lord Chaitanya's preaching and some of the preaching he did, which will be, hopefully, will be inspirational for us. Um, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, preached in different ways. He converted people in different ways. One way he converted people is just by his presence. <laughs> Simply by seeing the Lord, people became Vaishnavas. <laughs> Another way he converted, he inspired people was through the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. When they took up the chanting of the Hare Krishna Mahamantra, His, uh, his devotees, or him directly, and they became Vaishnavas. And he also empowered others to preach on his behalf. And certain persons who were very powerful manifestations of his mercy simply by associating with them, such as Nisringa Brahmachari, they immediately became devotees also. So the Lord did it directly, and He also did it indirectly. But some of the ways He did it very directly was when He met certain persons who had contrary philosophies and were somewhat fixed in their philosophy. He defeated the Buddhists. He defeated the Mayavadis. And He also um, defeated... Uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, who was a Mayavadi impersonalist. So we'll explore some of the events centered around Lord Chaitanya's activities in relationship to these. When Lord Chaitanya was traveling in South India, he met a group of Buddhists. <laughs> and it was arranged that he speak to the Buddhists. Now, Buddhist philosophy is sunyavad, and there is no conception of God or even the soul. And therefore, Lord Chaitanya spoke the principles of Vaishnavism in contrary to the Buddhist of princi the principles of Buddhism. I'll read one of the principle. What are the principles of Buddhism? And then Lord Chaitanya's, what we say, response. Because one of the things is that we, when we meet people who are of opposite philosophies, generally we don't get involved with discussions. But sometimes it's unavoidable, and sometimes for the sake of others, we do that. Because nowadays people don't accept defeat, even if they're defeated. <laughs> but people who listen, they benefit. So we take on debates and, or what we say, discussions with people with contrary philosophies just to present our philosophy to people in general. Who Those who hear these discussions will, be un will understand deeper what is Vaishnava philosophy and become convinced. So that is one of the reasons why we take up these discussions. Uh, Lord Chaitanya, he came in contact with the head of one Buddhist sect, and he was there with his followers. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur explains that what is the philosophy? There are two kinds of Buddhism, Hinayana and Mayayana. And along the Buddhist path, there are nine principles. And I'll read the nine principles. The creation is eternal, therefore there is no need to accept a creator. <laughs> Two, the cosmic manifestation 
is false. Three, I am is the truth. Four, there is repetition of birth and death. Five, Lord Buddha is the only source of understanding the truth. Six, the principles of nirvana or annihilation is the ultimate goal. Seven, the philosophy of Buddha is the only philosophical path. Eight, the Vedas are compiled by human beings. Nine, pious activities showing mercy to others and so on are advised. Pious activities and showing mercy to others are advised. No one can attain the absolute truth by argument. One must be very expert in logic and another person may even be more expert in the art of argument. So sometimes even though you have the truth, if someone's a better arguer, you may be defeated. Because there is so much word jugglery and logic, one can never come to the real conclusion about the absolute truth by argument. What is that verse? There's a verse that Tarko Pratishte Sutaram Vibhinnam Naseva Vindapur Mahajano Yena Katasapanta that the truth of all religious principles is hidden in the hearts of the pure devotees of the Lord. So one may argue back and forth and one philosophical person is, has another angle on the philosophy. So arguments will go on forever. So how do you find truth? It's in the heart of pure devotees of the Lord. Mahajanena yet. Mahajano yena katasa panta. Panta means path. Path of the Mahajans is the way to go, to follow the pure devotees. They can reveal the truth. Although one may read scripture, still one can never come to a conclusion because scripture is very difficult to understand and very, very variegated and also meant for different people on different levels of understanding. So although one may read scriptures, one still may not come to the correct conclusion. <laughs> so here, the followers of the Vedic principles understand this. However, it is seen that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu defeated the Buddhist philosophy by argument. Those who are preacher in Iskot in preachers in this gun will certainly meet many people who believe in intellectual arguments. Most of these people do not believe in the authorities of the Vedas. Nevertheless, they accept intellectual speculation and argument. Therefore, the preachers of the Krishna consciousness, preachers of Krishna consciousness, should be prepared to defeat others by argument. Just as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did. In this verse is clearly said, Tarko Kandila Prabhu. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu put forward such a strong argument that the Buddhists could not counter him to establish their cult. The first principle is that the creation has always existed. But if this were the case, there would be no theory of annihilation. The Buddhists maintain that annihilation or dissolution is the highest truth. If the creation eternally exists, then there's no question of dissolution or annihilation. So, contrary, they make contrary statements in their own. This argument is not very strong. By practical example, we see that material things have a beginning, a middle, and an end. The ultimate aim of the Buddhist philosophy is to dissolve the body. This is proposed because the body has a beginning, Similarly, the entire cosmic creation is a gigantic body, but if we accept that it always exists, then there's no question of annihilation. Therefore, the attempt to annihilate everything in order to attain zero is an absurdity. By our own practical experience, we have to accept the beginning of creation, and we have to accept the beginning. We must accept a creator. <laughs> Such a creator must possess an all-pervasive body, as pointed out in Bhagavad Gita. Sarvata pariparam tat, sarvato shiksuro mukam, sarvata sutimam loke, sarva avritta tishtati. Everywhere is his hands and legs, 
his eyes, heads, and faces, and he has ears everywhere. In this way, the super soul exists and pervades everything. The Supreme Person must be present everywhere. His body existed before creation, otherwise he could not be the creator. If the Supreme Person is a created being, there is no question of, an, of a creator. Therefore, the conclusion is that the cosmic manifestation is certainly created at a certain time, and the Creator existed before the creation, therefore the Creator is not a created being. Did you follow that? Yeah. Okay. The Creator is Param Brahma, the Supreme Brahman. Matter is only subordinate to spirit, but, it, but is actually created on the basis of spirit. So before everything existed, there was spirit, which is the source of bringing matter into existence. When the spirit soul enters the womb of the mother, the body is created by material ingredients supplied by the mother. Everything is created in the material world, and consequently there must be a creator who is the supreme spirit and who is distinct from matter. It is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita that material energy is inferior and that the spiritual energy is the living entity both inferior and spiritual energy inferior and spiritual energies belong to the supreme person the buddhists argue that the world is false but this is not valid the world is temporary but is not false as long as we have a body we must suffer the pains and pleasures of the body even though we are not the body we might not take these pleasures and pains very seriously, but they are factual nonetheless. We cannot actually say that there are faults, just like there is the Zen Buddhists. They hit you on the head with a stick. And have you ever been to Zen Buddhism? Yeah, any of you? They hit you on the head with a stick, and they say that pain you feel is simply false. It does not exist. <laughs> okay? You got it? <laughs> and people submit themselves to that type of, you know, you know because the body is false and the pain is also false, therefore the stick is also false and me hitting you is also false, so the conclusion is it's all false. <laughs> you got it? <laughs> it makes complete sense, right? <laughs> okay. If the bodily pains and pleasures were false, the creation would also be false, and consequently would, no one would take much interest. The conclusion is that the material creation is not false or imaginary, but it is temporary. Temporary means it comes into being and then disappears, but during its existence, it has some value. Although it is temporary, it is not false. So, therefore, devotees understand the nature of everything temporary and deal with the etern eternal and don't put much importance on the temporary, but still have to deal with the temporary in order to practice devotional service within the realm of the, the temporary by bringing about a consciousness of the eternal based on using the temporary for the service of the eternal. Does that make sense? No. Okay, in other words, everything is the energy of the Lord. It's temporary. When it's used in the service of the Lord, it becomes transcendental. It's no longer material. Because when the matter connects with spirit, it takes on the element of spirit also. So therefore, although it is temporary, it has value in bringing the consciousness of the living entity from material to spiritual by connecting the material with the spiritual through devotional service. Okay. Is that clear? Now, rather, the Buddhists say it's all false and therefore nothing has any meaning. Therefore, it's, it's, all, it's all an illusion. And we have to live within the illusion, that's all. Okay. All right, so here in the third one, the Buddhists maintain that the principle I am is the ultimate truth. 
But this excludes the individuality of you and I. If there is no I and you, or individually, then there's no possibly possibility of argument. <laughs> I'll read that again. I don't think you got that one. <laughs> the Buddhists maintain the principle, I am is the ultimate truth. But this excludes the individuality of I and you. If there is no I and you, or individuality, there is no possibility of argument. The Buddhist philosophy depends on argument, but there can be no argument if one simply depends on I am. There must be a you or another person. <laughs> the philosophy of duality, the existence of the individual soul and the super soul must be there. This is confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Never was a time when I did not exist, nor you, nor all these kings, nor in the future, so anyone person to me. So we are all eternal. So there's many eyes, but there is one you, Krishna. <laughs> yeah. So they say, I am is all there is, <laughs> nothing else. <laughs> totally bogus. <laughs> okay. We existed in the past in different bodies, and after the annihilation of this body, we shall exist in another body. The principle of the soul is eternal and exists in the body or in another body. Even in this lifetime, we experience in a child's body, a youth's body, a, a, a man's body, an old body. After the annihilation of the body, we acquire another body. The Buddhist cult also accepts the philosophy of transmigration, but the Buddhists do not properly explain the next birth. There are 8,400,000 species of life, and our next birth may be in one, any one of them. Therefore, this human body is not guaranteed. According to the Buddha's fifth principle, Lord Buddha is the only source of attaining knowledge. We cannot accept this, for Lord Buddha rejected the principles of Vedic knowledge. One must accept the principle of standard because one can attain the absolute truth simply by intellectual speculation. If everyone is an authority, or if everyone accepts his own intelligence as the ultimate creation, as it is presently fashionable, the scriptures will be interpreted in many different ways, and everyone will claim that his own philosophy is supreme. Yatamat tatapat. I'm okay, you okay, you have your philosophy, I have my philosophy, my philosophy is to kill you, and your philosophy is to let me kill you. <laughs> so, probably, you know, Prabhupada made that argument. My okay, if my philosophy is, is my philosophy is to kill you, then my philosophy, my, then my philosophy is to stop you from killing me. <laughs> so, whose philosophy is more is correct? <laughs> Both of them are wrong, because <laughs> it's creations of somebody's mind, that's all. This has become a great problem, and everyone is interpreting scripture in their own way and setting up their own authority. Yatamata tatapata. Now everyone and anyone is trying to establish his own theory as the ultimate truth. The Buddhists theorize that annihilation, or nirvana, is the ultimate goal. Annihilation applies to the body, but the spirit soul transmigrates from one body to another. If this were not the case, how, many, uh, how can so many multifarious bodies come into existence? If the next birth is a fact, the next bodily form is also a fact. As soon as we accept the material body, we must accept the fact that the body will be annihilated and that we will have to accept another body. If all bodies are doomed to annihilation, we must obtain a non-material body or spiritual body. And if we wish the next birth to be anything but false, how the spiritual body is attained is explained by Krishna 
In the Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Chime Divyam, Evam Yo Veti Tattva Daha Tattva Teham Purna Janma, Naitimam Eti Surjuna. One who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities does not, upon leaving his body, take birth again in this material world, but attains to my abode, Arjun. So the Buddhas say, the body gets annihilated and there's no soul, but still you get another body. <laughs> but who gets another body? <laughs> Where? <laughs> who? You, you're no longer existing, so how can you get anything? <laughs> okay. This is the highest... Pr one to, to give up one's material body and not to accept another body in return back to, is, it means to go back home, back to Godhead. If that is not perfection, it is not that perfection means one existence becomes void or zero. There's a joke. <laughs> I'll just tell a little joke. One head of a Buddhist, he was his birthday. So his followers brought him a present, and it was a big box. And he was all ra wrapped up very nicely with all kinds of decorations on the outside. And he opens a box, and there was nothing in the box. <laughs> so this, he, he says to his followers, thank you. Just what I always wanted, nothing. <laughs> okay, does that help a little bit? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we cannot accept the theory that the Buddhist philosophy is the only way, for so there are many defects in that philosophy. A perfect philosophy is one that has no defects, and that is Vedanta philosophy. No one can point out any defects in the Vedanta philosophy, and therefore we conclude that Vedanta is the supreme philosophical way of understanding the truth. According to the Buddhist cult, the Vedas are compiled by ordinary beings. If this were the case, they would not be authoritative. From the Vedic literatures, we can understand that shortly after creation, Lord Brahma was instructed in the Vedas. It's not that the Vedas were created by Brahma, although Brahma is the original person in the universe. If Brahma did not create the Vedas, but he is acknowledged as the first created being, from where did Vedic knowledge come to Brahma? Obviously, the Vedas did not come from ordinary person born in the material world. Tene Brahma Yada Yadi Kabaye. The Supreme Person imparted Vedic knowledge within the heart of Brahma. There is no person in the beginning of creation other than Brahma, yet he did not compile the Vedas. Therefore, the conclusion is that the Vedas were not compiled by any created being. Vedic knowledge was given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who created this material world. This is also accepted by Sankaracharya, although he is not of a Vaishnava. It is stated that mercy is one of the qualities of a Bodhi, Buddhist, but mercy is a relative thing. We show our mercy to a subordinate or to one who is suffering more than ourselves. However, if there is no superior person present, the superior person cannot be the object of our mercy. Rather, we are objects for the mercy of the Supreme Person. Therefore, showing compassion and mercy is a relative activity. Can that make sense? Yeah? Did you get that one? So, mercy comes from one who has mercy. So, it's a relative thing, and so if I'm just an ordinary person, how can I give you mercy? It has to come from a source who is actually the source of mercy. Rather, we are objects of mercy, therefore showing compassion and mercy is a relative activity. It is not the absolute truth. Apart from this, we must know what actual mercy is. To give a sick man something forbidden to eat is not mercy. Rather, it is cruelty. Unless we know what mercy really is, we may create an undesirable situation. If we want to show real mercy, we will preach Krishna consciousness in order to receive, revive the lost consciousness of the human beings, the living entity's original consciousness. 
Since the Buddhist philosophy does not admit the existence of the spiritual soul, the so-called mercy of the Buddhists is defective. What can you do for the body? <laughs> it's destined. So this is... Now, Lord Chaitanya, using the arguments that we just mentioned, as explained by Srila Prabhupada, very soundly defeated this Buddhist. But the Buddhists were unhappy to be defeated. <laughs> so they wanted to cause Lord Chaitanya some harm. So they said, oh, okay. We would like to offer you some prasadam. <laughs> So the Buddhist followers came back in a few minutes with this big plate of contaminated bad food they were going to offer to Lord Chaitanya just to show that they were, you know, unhappy to be defeated because they couldn't defeat Lord Chaitanya. And so the Lord saw the offering and he accepted it. But just about when he was ready to eat it, a gigantic bird came flying out of the sky. The plate was heavy. It was an iron plate. He picked up the plate with all the food and went flying in the sky, and all the food was flying all over the place. And then the bird flew around and dropped the plate, and it landed on the head of the chief Buddhist <laughs> and knocked him unconscious. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and then all his followers started to cry. <laughs> and then Lord Chaitanya came along and brought the Buddhist back to consciousness. But he was feeling the false pain of the being hit on the head <laughs> with the plate of contaminated food. <laughs> So, Mahaprabhu, <laughs> he used logic and argument to defeat certain persons, and others, he simply showed his transcendental form. Others, he propagated the teachings of, of chanting the holy names of the Lord, and others, way he empowered others to do the same. So, Lord Chaitanya used various methods in order to purify people and bring them to devotional service. Mm -hmm. So tonight we're focusing on the principle of discussion or debate because I think as a society we are quite weak in that area. If we were to face some philosophers we would definitely be looking pretty bad. Although we have the knowledge to be able to present it in opposition of contrary arguments is an art. And that takes some practice. Therefore, Prabhupada used to teach us through Sarup Damodar Goswami, especially, and, and his other followers, on his morning walks. And he would ask Sarup Damodar, what are the scientists saying? What are, they, what are they, these people saying? What are, what are these people saying? And then he would hear the philosophies, and then he would present Krishna Consciousness. And many times, Sarup Dhammadar Goswami would take the position of the protagonist and argue with Prabhupada just to bring out the arguments more and more. And in doing that, Prabhupada was instructing his disciples how we should be able to understand this philosophy and present it in contrary to uh, other philosophical teachings. Because a lot of times people in the material world, they have a particular philosophy and they know how to present it. And so to know your philosophy is one thing, to present it is a step up when you're in contrary. Therefore, if we carefully study Srila Prabhupada's books, especially his arguments, we'll get an idea how to present this and and when we also come in contact with this in day-to-day -day life through various types of medias, we can understand what is that media and what is the faults in that media. So, 
therefore, it's important that we have this acumen of philosophical understanding and be able to present Krishna consciousness to others. There are three types of devotees. They're first class, second class, third class. The first class devotee, their faith is not so strong and when they come in contrary with, con they come in contact with contrary philosophies and they're defeated, they give up Krishna consciousness. The second class devotee, well, is a little bit more fixed in his faith, is stronger. He will debate with others, but sometimes he will not be able to defeat them, but he will not give up his Krishna consciousness. And the first class devotee will be able to present arguments in contrary to all philosophies and present the clear understanding of Vaishnava Siddhanta. So we have three levels of, of devotees. So we should be at least on the second class, that if we're ever defeated, we shouldn't be defeated, but if we are, we will not go away and give up Krishna consciousness. <laughs> uh, I've been in contact with Mayavadis through my whole life. <laughs> I went to one conference in Texas and on the request of the GBC to represent uh, Christian to represent ISKCON in a Mayavadi conference. <laughs> and boy, was that painful. <laughs> the VHP, Varishad Hindu Prashad, uh, they requested us to go and be represented there. So just to satisfy them, they contacted our GBC and Anutama Prabhu, the Minister of Communications, he said, called me up and said, you're the one. <laughs> you're my, no, he didn't say him. He said, you go, and I had to sit there and listen to Mayavadi philosophy for days. <laughs> I got to speak, and I spoke on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's philosophy of Achintya Beta Beta Tarfa. And, uh, but, you know, I was kind of like, you know, like a pot that was boiling but wasn't exploding. Because <laughs> when you listen to that, you get really upset. <laughs> and then we had another occasion when we went to Parliament of Religions in Barcelona. I was with Srub Dhammada Goswami. And it was Hindu night, Taribo. So all the Hindu group came, and the Mayavadis got there first and took over the whole stage and the whole performance, and they conducted everything. So we sat there listening to them. <laughs> Subdhamadarga was, was very gracious. I was getting more angrier than anything. <laughs> you know, that's my nature anyway. <laughs> so... Uh, so there was like, and he was, and then they let him speak. <laughs> and he just spoke on this one verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, what is that? Vasudeva yata makam, Vasudeva yata kriya. Vasudeva is everything. He's the source of most. In Vasudeva, Vasudeva, about ten different categories of what Vasudeva is, and Vasudeva is Krishna himself. And he presented that very nicely. Everybody listened. I don't know if the Mayavadis got it. <laughs> but there was a lot of Mayavadi followers there. And some of them, there was a large group of people who just came for the program. So the Mayavadis relinquished their stage after most of the program. And then we took over and we began Kirtan. And when we began Kirtan, all the Mayavadis left. <laughs> but not their followers. <laughs> just, the, just the guys who were actually the, you know, the main guys. And many of the followers stayed. And at the end, they came up to me. Some of them, we had tears in their eyes. And they said, this is really nice. Thank you. They loved the, the, the kirtan. Sometimes Prabhupada would go to these Pandal programs where they have all these Mayavadi speakers. And Prabhupada, they always put him last. <laughs> so Prabhupada would be sitting there tapping his cane 
and, and getting more angry listening to these Mayamani. <laughs> and then when it was time for Prabhupada to speak, he would just have kirtan and the whole place would explode and, and that's all they would remember, <laughs> the kirtan. <laughs> Because if you listen to Mayavadi philosophy, you can't figure out what the hell they're saying. <laughs> it sounds good, but it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's kind of like contrary to... So, but don't, the idea is not to listen to it because it, it is very insidious and very, what we say, tricky. It's based on word juggery, using sastric information twisted around according to a different meaning. So Lord Chaitanya said, Mayavadi Krishna Aparadi. Mayavadis are very offensive to Krishna, like that. So Lord Chaitanya Although he was the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he did use different situations to defeat people in order to establish the true Siddhanta of devotional service. So that was the Buddhist. Hmm. Any questions on... The first one? Buddhist philosophy, Krishna consciousness, process of... Okay. No questions? Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for this nice dissertation. Um, this uh, Buddhist philosophy, uh, which uh, which school of Buddhism is this, or this is like uh, the principle of m of most of them, like is the same? Or well, there's so many schools. There's Theravada, there's Hinayana, there's Mayana, there's Zen, like that. There's Pure Land Buddhism, which accepts the Supreme Lord. They call it Kuan Yin. But in, in one place, Kuan Yin is a woman, in one place, Kuan Yin is a man. So they have different conceptions. Um, bodhisattvas. If you, there's a couple books where the devotees, Prabhupada discusses Buddhism with one. Satyaraj also does it one with Buddhism, like that. But ultimately, the Buddhist philosophy is that the goal is to become nothing. Why? Because material life is miserable. Material life is miserable. Therefore, to avoid out material life means to avoid out your existence in the material way. But because they have no conception of spirituality, they think there's no soul. They, therefore, they, their ultimate principle is, you know, everything material is maya, it's false and illusion, and when you enter into the unmanifested void, you become nothing, and then you have reached perfection. So, it's really difficult to theorize because it doesn't have any logic. So there are different schools in my, of, of Buddhism like that. The best is the Hinayana Buddhism. They're a little bit personal, a little bit, but not much. <laughs> I mean, I studied Buddhism a little bit, and I also interacted with Buddhists like that. They're nice people. <laughs> Because they believe in nonviolence and, you know, but they have no philosophy. Because Buddhists, Buddhist, and if you understand the inception of Buddhism, Buddhism is Buddhist was the supreme personality of Godhead. 
But he came for a particular mission. He came to stop people from using the Vedas for animal slaughter. People were abusing the Vedic parts of the Vedas and taking animals and killing them using the principle of rejuvenating the animal, which is a Vedic principle, a sound Vedic principle, because no one was qualified. They were just destroying animals and eating meat. So in order to show compassion to the animals, the Lord advented as Buddhist, as Buddha. And he, told, he said, forget your Vedas. So he threw out the Vedas. Therefore, he's called Gnostic. Gnostic means atheist. He taught atheism in the name of compassion. <laughs> so if you understand a different jai, chattattva ki jai, the different stages, then from Buddha comes Sankaracharya, bringing them slowly back, then Madhvacharya back into uh, dual dualism, and then Sankar and Madhva, uh, Ramanujacharya, Madhvacharya, then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which is the complete philosophy. So all this was orchestrated by the Lord in order to, bring, to destroy sub-religious principles and to bring people gradually back to the Vedas like that. So Buddha was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He incarnated for that purpose, just to save the animals. Mm -hmm. Because the animals are also spirit soul. God doesn't make distinction between one spirit soul and another. He loves all living entities equally. Mm -hmm. So to exploit the, living, the lower living entities in the name of religion, which people do, and Buddhists said, forget the Vedas and just follow the Eightfold Path of Mysticism. Follow these basic principles of morality. <laughs> he didn't teach higher knowledge. He taught basic morality. If you study the life of Buddhism, he was born in a very rich, acoustic He was a prince. He was born in a royal family. <laughs> so it's interesting. But he had a mission. His mission was to get people off the Vedas so they would stop killing animals indiscriminately. Yes. Prabhupada uh, have in start Krishna consciousness have uh, only half mantra Namo Vishnu Pada Krishna Pishtaya Bhutale Shimate Bhakti Venta Samyam Taramne and after give Shunavad in Nirvishesha yeah. and give explanation devotee also have conception Nirvishesha yeah. Shunavad I, I, I think I living here in natural world Many thousand million of life. I'm living here, mm -hmm. not world. Means I have many, many million life. My body is Yeah. I have connect. Sometimes I have also problem for many time for devotee. Ignore, ignore. Um, uh, Noga puta sam srao tu koncepciju kod bakta. He met uh, many times this conception uh, in devotees' lives also. Which problem is that? Yeah. That's no, why no, 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 no simple change. <laughs> that's, why Prabhupada, that's why Prabhupada introduced that mantra. Yeah. The deviation came in Nuvrindavan in 1970, where some people were saying that Prabhupada is not saying it, but he's Vishnu himself. Therefore, he said, Namaste Saraswate Deve Gauravani Pracharine. He is the yeah, representative of Saraswati Devi, which is Bhakti Siddhanta. Gauravani Pracharine, he came to the Western world to, to give the message of Lord Chaitanya and to destroy Nirishesha Sunyavadi, Buddhism and atheism, or bu atheism and mayavadiism, which is another form of atheism. 
Sankaracharya also said that, that I come in the form of this Brahmin to teach sub-religious principles for people you know, who are similar to Buddhists. So Mayavadi was, is actually similar to Buddhism. They're both forms of atheism. One says God does not exist, that's the Buddhist, and then the other one says God exists but he has no form. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I, I think you exist, but you have no head, no legs, no lung, nothing. You just, you're, not, you're there, but you're not there. <laughs> you're just a big white light, and how can you love a white light? <laughs> it's usually too bright to love. So if you would carefully, listening to Prabhupada's explanations, everything becomes clear. Everything becomes clear. <laughs> now, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came to the temple of Jagannath. He fainted. Seeing Lord Jagannath, and he fainted in ecstasy and stayed in that state. One very powerful uh, impersonalist, who was also a big, a very popular scholar of the Vedas was Sarabhama Bhattacharya. Now he saw this beautiful sannyasi fainted. He called his men and uh, because when the guards saw Lord Chaitanya fainting, they were going to beat him with sticks. But Sarabhama Bhattacharya stopped him and said, have him come to my place. He was attracted by Lord Chaitanya's beauty. And Lord Chaitanya remained in somewhat unconscious state. Gradually, Lord Chaitanya's followers, who had finally caught up with him, came and they found out where he was. And he was at the house of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. Now, Gopinath Acharya who was the nephew of Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. He was a disciple, a follower of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He started to discuss with, with uh, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya that this person is actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And now Bhattacharya was not listening, and uh, Gopinath Acharya was getting angry. <laughs> and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said, you know, we're just discussing, don't get angry. <laughs> Finally, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came back to consciousness. And then Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya felt that he's a wonderful sannyasi. I have to teach him Vedanta Sutra. So uh, he said to the Lord, you know, uh, I want to explain the teachings of Vedanta Sutra. Lord Chaitanya said, fine. And so for seven days, every day, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya explained Vedanta Sutra. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sat there quietly, respectfully, and listened. Didn't fall asleep. <laughs> and then after seven days, he never said a word. But Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya said, now I'm speaking. I've been talking for seven days. You're not saying anything. You're not asking any questions. Is everything clear? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu responded in a very interesting way. He said, Vedanta Sutra is as bright as the sun, but your explanations are like the clouds covering the sun. <laughs> Pretty much he said, I don't believe anything you say. <laughs> well, Sarvabhama Bhattacharya was really shocked to hear that. And then he said, you, okay, then let me hear your explanation. And for uh, f many hours, the Lord spoke to Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya. And so,
Sir, I understand Vedanta philosophy very clearly, but I cannot understand your regulation, your explanations. There was then a discussion between Bharachari and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu concerning the authority of the Vedic scriptures, especially the Upanishads and Vedanta Sutra. The Bhattacharya was an impersonalist, but Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu proved that the absolute truth is the supreme personality of Godhead. He proved that the conceptions of the Mayavadi's philosophers concerning the impersonal absolute truth are incorrect. If you read that chapter, Lord Chaitanya makes so many nice points using examples of the difference between personalism and impersonalism. So if you want to know the discussions and arguments, that chapter, which is chapter 6 of Madhya Leela, Lord Chaitanya makes many interesting and very practical points explaining how personalism is the source of impersonalism. That the absolute truth contains both qualities, personal and impersonal. But the source of the absolute truth is coming from a person. So the, abs the impersonal aspect of the absolute truth, which is also true, but it is relative to the personal, and it's subordinate to the personal. It's the energy of the personal and not the absolute principle. Therefore, Vedanti tat tadvad vidvams tadvad yaj jnanam avyayam brahmeti paramatmeti bhagavaniti sabjate. The absolute truth contains Brahman realization, Paramatma realization, and Bhagavan realization. Three in one. The absolute truth is one, it's not three, but it has three aspects to it. Each one more complete than the previous. So the Brahman realization is the impersonal realization, that is that everything is spirit. And that the entire creation is pervaded by the spiritual energy of Brahman effulgence, which is the light coming from the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Higher than that is Paramatma realization, where Krishna resides in the heart of all living entity, guiding the living entity accordingly, uh, localized. So Brahman is all-pervading, Paramatma is localized. And higher than that, or a complete understanding of the Absolute Truth, is Bhagavan realization that the Personality of Godhead has six outstanding qualities. He is full of knowledge, full of wealth, strength, knowledge, uh, fame, renunciation, beauty. He is the reservoir of all these characteristics and qualities. He is a person. So therefore, personalism is everywhere. Wherever you, where do you see impersonal? Impersonal is simply the energy of the person. Just like you may own a car, that's your energy, that's your impersonal part of you. It's the energy that you use for your activities. Therefore, therefore the energy of the Lord is the, is the, is the activity that goes on in the material world and in the spiritual world energy. But there's behind that, there is a person like that. Even the Upanishads make it clear. One of the last verses in the Upanishads says, remove that blinding effulgence so I can see your, per your beautiful personal form. <laughs> so, but Bhagavad Gita says that personal and impersonal are two aspects of the Absolute Truth. And but uh, ultimately Mahaprabhu established through this argument that everything is based on personalism. And impersonalism is just the energy of the person, that's all. <laughs> so if you read that chapter, you have a clear understanding the difference between personal and impersonal. And, and Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, although a great scholar of the Vedas, he couldn't say anything. <laughs> he was defeated, and in those days when you were defeated, you changed. Nowadays, when people are defeated, they don't change. 
because they have no philosophy. They wear their philosophy as an egoistic expression of some attitude that they develop. And therefore, they keep that ego, even though they have no basis for their solid understanding. So this is Kali Yuga. Because in, in previous times, if you were defeated, you would have to follow that person who defeated you. Therefore, people would only enter into debates knowing that I have to win if I don't win, and I have to convert. <laughs> like that, so. And so debating was done in a very serious way. <laughs> like that. <laughs> so, and there's a lot of that there. <laughs> So Mahaprabhu, uh, he did that with Varm Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya, he did that with, with the Buddhists, and he also did it with Prakasananda Saraswati, and that's a long story. How he defeated Prakasananda Saraswati is amazing. He came into the town of Kashi, or Bar Benares, and performed kirtan. The Mayavadis were f making fun of the devotees, thinking they were just sentimental fanatics, singing and dancing. People say that now, even now. It's a nice carnival you guys get, but they don't see the spiritual substance behind it. And sometimes they think it's just some frivolous activities that people do. So, Mm, Mahaprabhu didn't care what the Mayavadis were saying, but some of his followers were really offended, and they didn't really, they weren't happy to hear Maya, that Mahaprabhu was being criticized. So in order to appease his followers, he went to their, one of their meetings, and when he came in, he sat by the door. And the Mayavadis were there. And he sat there, and he didn't say nothing. He, now the door is a place where everyone comes and washes their feet before they enter into the room. So he sat at the, the most dirtiest place. Um, Prakasananda, who was the head of the Mayavadis, noticed Mahaprabhu and said, "You are, you know, you are coming from the Bharati. You know, Keshava Bharati as you grew, and he." he and so, um, you know, why are you dancing and chanting with these sentimentalists? Why don't you discuss philosophy? <laughs> Mahaprabhu said, well, actually, my spiritual master said I'm a fool. I cannot understand philosophy, so just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> and so then he went on to explain the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and how the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is the glorification of the Supreme Personality of God and the Supreme Truth. The Mayavadis were impressed by his humility and by his bodily effulgence. That's what attracted the Mayavadis. He was very humble, and at the same time, he was effulgence. They could see that. So after that, after explaining that, Prakasananda says, well, why don't you discuss Vedanta? What is wrong with discussing Vedanta? So, a real Vaishnav should, however, study Vedanta philosophy. But after studying Vedanta, one does not adopt the chanting of the holy name of the Lord. He is no better than a Mayavadi. Therefore, one should not be a Mayavadi. One yet one should not should be one yet one should not be unaware of the subject matter of Vedanta philosophy. Indeed, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu exhibited his knowledge of Vedanta in his discourses with Prakasananda Saraswati. Thus, it is to be understood that a Vaishnava should be completely conversant in Vedanta philosophy, yet he should not think that studying Vedanta is all in all, and therefore be unattached to chanting of the holy name. A devotee must know the importance of simultaneously studying Vedanta philosophy and understanding it and chanting the holy names of the Lord. The Lord said, Vedanta philosophy consists of the words spoken by the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narayan in the form of Vyasadeva. Vedanta Krit Vedavid Eva Chaham, Krishna says in the Gita, 
I am compiler of Vedanta, I am the knower of the Vedas, the Vedas are men to know me. So all Vedic conclusion must end with devotion to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So establishing that fact, before he was able to establish that, he got the confidence of the Mayavadis by acting very humble. And when he was humble, they somehow or other were willing to listen. And so he presented. And then all the Mayavadis couldn't say anything. And they were defeated and practiced under and along with 60,000 Mayavadis and, Ma and Benaris all became Vaishnavas. And this was Mahaprabhu. So it's very hard to de debate with Mayavadis. We usually don't debate with Mayavadis. We just just beat them on the head with a stick. <laughs> so to, which of course we don't do that either, but <laughs> because they don't accept defeat. So the thing is just to have kirtan, and they run. <laughs> they don't. They don't. They go away from kirtan too fast. Yes, you had question. Hare Krishna. Actually, it is a question from Saraswati. Um, from our, our philosophy, we know that uh, Krishna created first uh, Brahma, Narada, Vyasadeva, and so on. And her question was, who was the first woman? Because from another philosophy, we know that first was Eve and Adam. So if we can know it. Well, we're not these bodies. <laughs> so man and woman is just a creation of the material energy. The soul is by nature, what we say, free from designation, but in the spiritual world you see you have spiritual forms that are male forms and female forms also. So the maya, the material energy is a reflection of the reality. So in the spiritual world, the internal energy, which is the pleasure energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, ma manifests itself as Srimati Radharani. Srimati Radharani manifests herself as the Lakshmis, the Gopis, and the... One more. La Lakshmis, the Gopis, and the Queens of Dwarka. So from, from Radharani, everything expands downward into spiritual forms like that. So, Brahma, when he created the material, when he was about to bring about the, the next creation, he created the male and female bodies. Now, the first male and female body, and I think it's Satarupa and someone else. So from these male and female bodies came, they were called progenitors. These progenitors had the job of bringing about the next creation by bringing a large amount of progeny or offspring like that. So when Brahma, from his body, he created these progenitors and those progenitors populated. So the male and female forms are coming as a reflection of the spiritual forms which are part of it, which are the original forms of the soul, like that. The soul by nature is female, but there are male forms and female forms in the spiritual world, like that. For the sake of ras, or for the sake of what we say, uh, exp exchanging loving relationships, like that. So we know there's five rasas. So, in there's the neutrality, servitude, friendship, and then Vatsaya Ras, then Krishna has his mother, father, like that. And there's so many other mothers, the Gopas, Gopis. And then, of course, in the 
in the Madhurya Ras, there are the female forms like that. So the, ma the, f the material forms of male and female are reflections of the reality. Prabhupada says, you have a, f a, mat um, uh, a human body, which is a reflection of Krishna's transcendental body. So That's why it says in the Christian scriptures, man was made in the image of God. But these these bodies are just matter. They're not us. That's not us. Don't get excited. <laughs> it's not you. When you look in the mirror in the morning, you think, uh, you should be happy to know that's not you. <laughs> yes, then, uh, <laughs> okay, I'm ready to go out. Now I'll do parikram and I'll give darshan. <laughs> so, yeah. No, don't get excited. These bodies are not us. We have to live in them. We have to deal with them. It's like you're stuck inside your car and you can't get out. <laughs> but it's not you. So these male and female forms were created by Lord Brahma to facilitate the creation, the next creation, that's all. To fulfill the, the, the material desires of the living entities to come to the material world and try to enjoy separate from Krishna. So like that. So in the spiritual world there's cows, there's everything you see in the material world is there in the spiritual world. But it's a reflection and not the reality. Hmm. Yes. So the first lady that's mentioned in the third canto, when Bob Brahma created the first male and female, I think I forgot the two names. One is called Satarupa and the other one I'm not sure. You have to go back to the the Bhagavatam to get the actual names of the original female and male forms in this creation. In previous creations it may have been different like that. Yeah. Hmm? Third canto. Yeah. Okay, so there was another question. Yes, Janava. Mm -hmm. uh, Hare, Hare Krishna. Um, it seems that uh, Buddhism is very popular nowadays. What is? It's popular. What is? Buddhism. Buddhism. Yeah, because it's easy. You don't it's have to easy. do anything. Uh, <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. um, <laughs> yes. Um, seems like uh, um, it attract attracts a lot of uh, students, and they think uh, sometimes uh, it is the. Um, extreme uh, renunciation the void uh, mm -hmm. the void yeah but it's not possible the, yeah <laughs> and uh, if i tell you become nothing is that exciting <laughs> <laughs> it's not really exciting <laughs> um another thing uh, um when um they speak about uh, impersonalism um is um, not the opposite of personalism. Um, I think it's personalism, impersonal, and non-personal. Uh, three different. Non-personal? Non-personal, personal, and created impersonal. Creation. And uh, so, because impersonal, it is included in person. Right. Okay. The impersonal is created within the personal, yes. but the personal is not created, it's not found within the impersonal. Yeah, so Buddhism is non-personalism. It's, it's a form of, it's called Sunyavadi. Sunyavadi means voidism. Voidism means to 
gradually remove yourself from everything material and then ultimately become nothing also. <laughs> So it's not impersonal, it's non-personal. It's atheism. It is. Yeah, because there's no conception of God. Well, Buddhism is atheism, Mayavadi is another form of atheism. But Mayavadi claims to accept the Supreme Lord, but they, their philosophy shows that he doesn't exist. Okay. Thank you. That's why they say, Om Namo Narayana, that everyone is Narayana. You're Narayan, I'm Narayan. I offer my obeisances to you, Narayan, and you offer your obeisances to me. I'm Narayan also. Guru Brahma, Guru Jiva, Guru Siva, Guru, 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 Guru. They're all, you know, the whole thing is Guru, Guru, Guru. So they get a Guru, and then when they become the Guru, they kick the Guru away, and they're the new Guru. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, they have the guru is everywhere. <laughs> they put so much emphasis on the guru, but ultimately, why? Because they want to be the guru. <laughs> That's why when Prabhupada, they were telling Prabhupada that Prabhupada is ultimately, you know, he's Krishna. And therefore, <laughs> Prabhupada made that. Mm, Prana mantra, Nirishesha Sunivari. Why? Because he says that the whole idea is that when you become guru, you become God. And he said something very powerful. He said, there's one thing that is worse than underestimating the guru, and that is overestimating the guru. To overestimate the guru is worse than underestimating the guru, because you become guru, and then you become God. <laughs> but God doesn't become. God is. And we become his servant. That's all. That's all we can be. So the Mayavadis say everything is one, and we say everything is one and different. So the soul, the jiva, never becomes the absolute truth, but exchanges loving relationships with the absolute truth, both in the conditioned state and in the liberated state. Both. Mm -hmm. Yes. There was a question somewhere. I saw a hand up. I thought I did. Maybe I'm. Maybe I'm hallucinating. <laughs> You can ask one, if you want. What is the time now, 8.30? We can stop soon. It's, it's very nice to, uh, to discuss this philosophy because you have to know it. Otherwise, you, you may be a devotee, but you still have an impersonal conception of God. Mm, he's asking, can we say that how many uh, individuals, persons are conditioned that so many they are in, impersonalists? Everybody. Practically everybody is an impersonalist. Impersonalist means to accept the, the material energy more important than the spiritual. Because the material energy is the impersonal aspect of the Supreme Lord. And therefore, in a very undefined way, we become impersonalists by accepting matter more important than spirit. And that's the whole world, practically. That's why everyone's impersonal. To use another person for your own self-interest is another form of impersonalism because you don't see the value of that person's existence, and you see they use another person as someone who can f fortify my needs, and therefore you're treating another person in the impersonal way. So impersonalism comes out in different forms like that. Like that. So devotees can act. Sometimes devotees act impersonally. So we have to get over that and understand that everything is a person and act accordingly. 
Therefore, everything is sacred. Even the energy is the, of the Lord is sacred because it's the non-different than the Lord for the service of the Lord. <laughs> Yeah, so everyone's in personalism, <laughs> practically, the whole world. You can also be an impersonalism when you, you can be a philosophical atheist and chant Hare Krishna. Why? And this is mentioned in the, sh the Shrutis, that if you think you are more important than God, then you are a philosophical atheist. In other words, you use God in order to get what you want. In other words, God becomes the object for enjoyment or for material gain, and then that's another form of atheism. You accept God, but you use the God as an object for, you, for whatever you want. So there are many persons who come to spiritual life or religious life, we can say, and perform activities. Why? So they can also gain something from that in a material way. And that is mostly the religions of today. It's about me using God for my interest. But in Vaishnav circles, the, the idea is, and Prabhupada would say, just like the Christians say, my dear Lord, give me our daily bread. So they pray for bread. So we say to Krishna, no, we don't ask Krishna for food. We ask him, Krishna, are you hungry? What can we feed you? <laughs> so they, we're asking God to feed us, and we're asking, and they're, we're at, they're asking God to feed us, and we're asking God, how can I feed you? <laughs> So there's a difference. <laughs> so we see that God is the object of our service to please Him, rather than trying to get something from God through the idea of service. So this is important to understand, because you can also see your own spiritual growth. Are you approaching Krishna to get something from Krishna, or are you approaching Krishna in order to serve Krishna for His pleasure. That's the difference between religion and spirituality. <laughs> many times not simply recognize. Hmm? Many times not simply recognize. Before one hour, two hour, I listen one documentary video, Bhaktivaibhava, his song is Bhaktivaibhava Swami, in Himal Himalaya and Ganga, and movie going, maybe hmm. you 30 minutes, yeah. and after 20 minutes, uh, one bhajan, Krishna Das chant bhajan, mm -hmm. means Mayavadi, the devotee no recognize, he put this bhajan in movie, Hare Krishna movie, and Mayavadi come, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Mayavadi, Krishna Das, <laughs> I listen, ah, oh, Krishna, I, I delete bhajan, <laughs> delete everything in here, I, I, I think in after, no simply recognize, this bhajan. This no bhajan, this. Mm. My lady. <laughs> Krishna Das's guru is a, was a personalist. But he's become a Mayavadi. <laughs> but his guru is Neem Karoli Baba. <laughs> which was a very powerful personalist. <laughs> Yeah. So there's people who are staunch impersonalists, and then there's people who are mixed. So in any philosophy, in any way of life, you'll find bhakti. Even in day-to-day -day life, there's elements of bhakti. But then again, bhakti is expanding until it gets to ananya bhakti. Ananya bhakti is undeviated bhakti, or pure devotional service. So that's the difference between Vaishnavism and other different practices that have bhakti in them. But bhakti is not only there. It's mixed with karma, jnana, or even material principles like that. So knowing these differences, you find that there's so many mixtures 
of spirituality and material conceptions going on in the name of different religions and different spiritual groups like that. So when to see what is real bhakti, you have to understand what is real, what are the principles of real bhakti, or or unalloyed bhakti, and that is ayabila sita sunya jnana karmana avitam anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttama. When you find that, you can see that's the real bhakti. Savai pum sam paro dharma nito bhakti yog suje ohoi tu ki. Apriyata, without stop and without material desire. So these are the principles of unalloyed bhakti. Now we may be still mixed in our practice of devotional service, but we're in the process of pure devotional service. So we are in a pure process, still mixed with material conceptions and sometimes even Mayavadi understandings. But if you stay in the process, eventually these things will gradually diminish and ultimately disappear. So it's a gradual process. And removing the anarthas and moving from one stage to another, you know, sangha bhajana kriya anartha nivritti nishta ruchi ashakti. And then when you get to raganuga bhakti, prema, bhakti bhava and prema, like that. So it's a very, it's a careful science. If you read carefully two books, which are both the same topics, one is a concise version, one is an expanded version, and that is Rupa Goswami's Nectar Devotion, is the science of bhakti. And the expanded version of that is Jaiva Dharma by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And if you read Jaiva Dharma, everything is there completely. So, but Rupa Goswami's um, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu is filled with explanations by Srila Prabhupada. So that is more connected to our process. So if you really want to know the science of bhakti, study that book. <laughs> Not read it, study it. Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It's one of the first, when Prabhupada began his movement, he started to translate this one other scripture called Nardas Bhakti Sutras. And he got to 13 verses and he stopped. He said, I want to do nectar devotion. It's more important. And then he switched and went to nectar devotion. That was in 1968. He began nectar devotion. And he knew that this is the, this is the complete science of bhakti. So... And there's four, four sections. The first 19 chapters of the essence of the process, and the rest are an expansion of the more intricate details of bhakti. Like that. So bhakti is a great science. We use the word science not in a, in a cliche way, but in a very exact way. It's the science of the soul's relationship with the Supreme Soul. Like that. Uh, it's simple and it's complicated. We were talking about the complicated. What makes it complicated is that we are still somewhat conditioned by our previous conditionings. So to get rid of our conceptions of what is wrong or what is not correct, that's a better word, instead of saying wrong, what is not correct, is, takes some time. Mm -hmm. Basically, we're all impersonalists. <laughs> and we have to get over that impersonalist attitude to the mood of service. And the mood of becoming a servant to Krishna, to the devotees, to people in general. When we develop that completely, that my relationship with everybody is I am their servant, then you're coming to bhakti, like that. We can accept service for the sake of offering service, 
but we don't accept service simply for the sake of because I want someone to serve me or I need someone to serve me. So we accept service for the sake of giving back something, but at the same time a devotee is never wants to accept service, but they always want to give service. This is the mood of bhakti. <laughs> So when that's directed at towards Krishna and his energy, then everything becomes easy. And how do you do that? When you understand Krishna takes care of his devotees completely. So whatever you may need to live in this world is found within the process of bhakti. Because Krishna provides everything for his devotee. If the devotee takes to the process with faith, if there's no lack of faith, then we cannot be what we say absorbed in service. We'll become we'll go back and forth. We'll go in and out of bhakti like that. Mm -hmm. So to stay in bhakti is to we have to read the books and chant the Hare and Krishna Maha Mantra and mostly we have to associate with Vaishnavas. And hear this philosophy, discuss it and uh, apply it in our day-to-day -day life. It's like that. But it's fun. It's not something dry or something, you know, arduous. It's very interesting. Prabhupada has made everything interesting in the form of his books and his lectures. Susukam kartamavyayam, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, it is a process of great joy. Susukam. Sukam means happiness. Susukam means very happy. It's very happy. Well, what makes it unhappy is that we don't want to leave our material attachments. So, <laughs> that's hard. <laughs> okay, so... Thank you. <laughs> so we stop here? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go Brimanande.